All right, guys, I'm going to be honest. When I started talking about Mormonism in these videos, the growth of my channel basically came to a halt. But this is why it's so important for me to get this information out there. If you're wondering why Mormons don't already know all the information in these videos, it's because we were warned our entire lives against looking at any outside information about our church. So if you're a Mormon watching this video, I want you to know two things. First of all, psychological studies have shown that it's totally normal for for you to feel afraid and even sick when questioning any of your beliefs. And this happens to everyone on both sides of a political and religious spectrum. And the second thing is, I want you to know that every single thing I talk about in my videos comes from actual historic documents from these events. And you can go and look them up. Mormon Think has done an amazing job of citing these sources. So with that said, I promised I would make this video about the biggest problem problems with the Book of Mormon that you are not going to find out in Sunday school. Now, if you're like I was and you believe the book to be from God, none of the problems inside the book are going to bother you in the slightest. So I'm going to do this video a little differently. I'm going to start by giving you the historic context surrounding the creation of the Book of Mormon. And that way you can logically assess these events and decide for yourself if it raises any flags. If you can just momentarily set aside the emotional attachment that's been poured over this book throughout your years in the church, I promise you will be able to make an educated decision based on a simple search for truth. After all, here's a quote by LDS leader J. Reuben Clark, if we have the truth, it cannot be harmed by investigation. So with that said, we're going to jump right in. Remember the testimony of the 11 witnesses on the cover page of the Book of Mormon as witnesses who saw and held the golden plates Joseph translated from? Now, many Mormons know that not a single one of these 11 witnesses remained a member of the church. In fact, Joseph himself is quoted calling them liars, counterfeiters, and thieves. But here's the crazy part you probably didn't know. Those same 11 witnesses turned around and joined another church led by a man named James Strange, who also translated a book of scriptures from metal plates that he dug up from the ground. And his book happens to have a near identical looking witness page to the Book of Mormon. It turns out it was common practice in those days to include a witness page. Nobody had to give their actual signature signature, so it wasn't a legal document, and they used it as a way to increase the credibility of the book and also to increase book sales. So these witnesses that we've been relying on for the truth of Joseph's testimony of the gold plates ended up just hopping on to another religion with another man claiming to be a prophet of God and translating a book of metal plates. So here's a question I have for you. Can you really trust witnesses who don't believe their own testimony? And here's another thought. What if the church of James Strange is actually the true church? And how would you know? Most Mormons actually have no idea just how many breakoffs there are from Mormonism because we were taught that we had the only true branch of Mormonism and that there were no other branches. So I'm going to include a link to an excellent video by Brother Jake on YouTube about the different breakoffs in Mormonism who followed different prophets. And maybe you can decide which prophet is the real one. Interesting tidbit, all of these churches use the same message method to read their book and then ask God if it's true. Apparently it works really well. But now we're going to talk about the reason Joseph Smith discovered the plates in the first place. The angel Moroni, right? Most Mormons know the story from Joseph's written account in the Pearl of Great Price that the angel Moroni visited him three times in September 1823. And that same angel Moroni visited him again every single year for four years till 1827 when he delivered the plates to him. But what they didn't tell you is that in every early LDS publication, including including Joseph's own written account in the original Pearl of Great Price, Times and Seasons, Millennial Star, 1842, we see Joseph clearly referring to that angel as Nephi, not Moroni. Even eyewitness accounts, including that of Joseph's own mother, Lucy Mack Smith, recorded that during Joseph's life, he referred to the angel that delivered the plates to him as Nephi 
not Moroni. And I'm going to include a link to all of these sources in the description below. But when you look up these documents and the history, you can see that the angel's name was changed to Moroni after Joseph's death. Now, because Moroni was the last prophet to write in the book, the last person to have the plates, and the person who buried them in the ground, it makes Joseph Smith's story make a lot more sense that Moroni would be the one that would give him the plates. So I'm sure that this is why they changed the name. And if this is the first time that you have heard about church leaders changing historic piece of information, boy are you in for a wild ride. Believe me when I say this is just the tip of the iceberg and when you are ready to head down the rabbit hole yourself and research into the actual historic documents yourself, visit mormonthink.com. But probably the most shocking whitewash document for me was finding out about Lucy Mack Smith's autobiography, Joseph's Mother. Her personal account of Joseph's upbringing, it revealed way too many details about the family's belief in magic and mysticism and gold digging and money-making endeavors that Brigham Young had every single copy he could get his hands on burned and destroyed when he took the saints out west so that he could rewrite the the image of Joseph Smith in the eyes of the saints. But original copies of Lucy Max Smith's written accounts still exist, and you can compare them with the whitewashed book sitting in Deseret Book right now, and comment back here if you see any red flags. So as far as the angel Moroni goes, they need you to believe that Joseph spent four years talking to an angel but he was deluded about who he was actually talking to. Or the church could just keep all early mentions of the angel as Nephi kept hidden away in the church vault and just hope no one asks too many questions. When you start researching church history, you're going to notice a pattern of this happening. Because over the years, many upstanding LDS historians who have done their research did start asking questions and writing books about it. For example, historic scholar Fawn Brody was the niece of David O. McKay and had access to the church vault where she was researching church history. She ended up writing the book No Man Knows My History and then was excommunicated for leaking the information. Jeremy Reynolds is another one of those people who asked too many questions. I first read about the issues surrounding the Book of Mormon from Jeremy Reynolds' letter to a CES director which has now become very circulated, very famous in the Mormon and ex-Mormon community. Now his letter is just an excellent summary of all of the issues that the church has been misleading about, but instead of giving him answers, church leaders um, told him they had no answers and also excommunicated him for sharing this information with the public. But thankfully, bringing all this information to light has had a huge hand in forcing the church to acknowledge this information on their own website in the new LDS church essays. So when I first read Jeremy Reynolds' CES letter, I was definitely shocked by a lot of the information that I had had no idea about. But I have to admit, when I got to the section about the Book of Mormon, I just completely glazed over it because I had spent my entire life feeling this powerful emotional attachment to it and just believing that it was the Word of God. So I couldn't possibly question anything about the Book of Mormon. So it wasn't until everything else in my world came crashing down, like finding out about Joseph's polygamy, the Book of Abraham being a hoax, and the suicide oaths that I was finally able to go back and reread that section in the CES letter about the Book of Mormon. And at that point, I was finally ready to consider these issues with a fresh perspective. Now that we're going to talk about the issues inside the text itself, I again want to recommend Brother Jake on YouTube. He makes an excellent video discussing the problems in an entertaining and thought-provoking way. But in this video, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of the biggest problems. Number one, the Book of Mormon was supposed to have been written in the time period between 600 BC and 400 AD in pre-Columbian America. The text repeatedly mentions horses, cattle, oxen, sheep, swine, goats, elephants, wheels, chariots, 
wheat, silk, steel, and iron. But the problem is that not a single one of these things actually existed in pre-Columbian America. The Native Americans had no knowledge of these tools or animals or modes of transportation, and they weren't even exposed to them until over a thousand years later when they were brought in by European explorers and settlers. These are called anachronisms, when a text is supposed to be written in a certain time period, but it contains something in a time period from the future. So it's like you dug up a time capsule that's supposed to be from the 1800s and it has a cell phone, an Xbox, and 13 other modern items in it. You would probably be raising an eyebrow about the authenticity of that time capsule. So what Mormon apologists do when they see this futuristic information inside the text is something like this. I know this passage clearly states, we sat around playing with an Xbox all day until my girlfriend texted my iPhone and asked me to Netflix and chill. So we know the text talks about specific future items, but that's just because Joseph put those words in there because he didn't know how to translate it. So what this passage should actually say is, we sat around the campfire playing with sticks all day till my girlfriend sent her sister to ask if I wanted to come hang out in her tent telling stories. So many battles in the Book of Mormon talking about steel swords, and none of the natives from North or South America had any steel. So many stories in the book talking about the people traveling around from city to city using horses and chariots, and the natives of North and South America didn't have any horses, didn't even have any knowledge of the wheel yet. Did you know that church-funded BYU archaeologist Tim Ferguson went on a 17-year search looking for the bones and the items in the Book of Mormon. And after 17 years of looking for evidence from these massive populations and massive battlegrounds, he concluded that they simply didn't exist. Now once again, so these videos don't go too long, I can only give you a drop in the bucket. If you are ready to look at these actual historic documents for yourself, please visit mormonthink.com. There are scores of people who have given years of their life trying to get this information out to the public. It is up to you to decide to open the door to your freedom. Thanks so much for watching my videos, guys. Reach out to me with a comment if you appreciate what I'm doing here, or if you have any questions about church history, I'm happy to answer them. Check out the other videos on my channel, and make sure to subscribe so you're notified when I post the next one, and hit that bell so that you'll actually get the notification. And I hope to see you guys in the next video.